In Matthew 23, Jesus lays out a series of woes upon the religious leaders in his time. Um, some very, very heavy statements condemning them for their hypocrisy and such. And at the end of chapter 23, or at the end of this discourse, he lays out this curse, um, uh, or really this, uh, this lament. I shouldn't say curse really so much. It is a lament. But Jesus says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so Jesus lets them know that because God has time after time after time sent them uh, those who would speak on his behalf to them to call them back to himself in their rebellion, uh, this is made obvious throughout much of their history, but especially and particularly in times like the uh, captivity of the northern tribes to Assyria, the captivity of the southern tribes to Babylon, and later under the uh, under the Medes, the Persians, and such, and then um, uh, and even currently here under Rome. Well, God has sent mouthpieces to them up to uh, uh, to the end of what we consider the end of the New, the Old Testament with Malachi and such, and then there are 400 silent years, and John the Baptist is now sent as the forerunner to the Messiah as yet another one calling the nation to repentance. But they would not. Ultimately, nationally, they are on the cusp of rejecting the Messiah who has come to deliver the kingdom to them and give and, and fulfill the promises made to them. However, they would reject him in the coming days. And he then, therefore, uh, again, in that passage, lays out a lament because of their hardness of heart and what is going to come upon them as a result of this. Now, as the passage continues now in chapter 24, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And so Jesus is beginning to sort of depart that area, but the disciples sort of stop him and point out the temple and all of this. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, this must have come as a bit of a shock to them because the temple that was standing there was magnificent. Uh, it was a temple that had originally been built uh, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, in the waves of returns to, uh, to Judah from um, you know, under Cyrus the Persian. Um, ultimately, uh, this temple would then be uh, built upon by Herod the Great uh, as a means of sort of ingratiating himself to the people and sort of keeping them in line. Uh, and, and so this, this structure was uh, impressive, to say the least. Uh, and so for them to hear Jesus say that the day is coming when none of this that you're looking at here is going to be intact. In fact, not one stone will be left upon another. That had to come as a shock to their system. Um, and so they understandably begin to ask him about it. And verse 3 goes on. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? And so they ask him a series of questions. Uh, it would appear to be three questions about, well, when is the temple going to be destroyed, like you're describing? In my view, that question is actually answered in Luke's recording of this account in chapter 21 of his gospel. Also, uh, Mark also records the uh, Olivet Discourse here, as it's known uh, in, in, in Mark 13 as well. But here, Jesus tends to focus, it seems to focus, uh, the recording, I should say, Matthew uh, records, seems to focus more on the second and third question, the sign of his coming and of the end of the age. Uh, so that being said, uh, he now launches into, once again, what is known as the Olivet Discourse. This is a pivotal passage in terms of understanding eschatology or last things. This now gives us, as some have called it, the backbone of New Testament eschatology. And so Jesus now begins to describe things that will actually be referred to elsewhere in the New Testament and uh, by extension in many respects in the Old Testament as well. Now we're going to take some time to look at this today. It's not going to be a cursory overview, but I will uh, mention that this is also likely not going to be as deep as it could be, but I will put a lot of these passages that we're going to reference uh, in the notes so that you can continue to do some homework on this, as is really always my encouragement. My desire is that this would not uh, simply be a, a one-off kind of a Bible study, but really would, would, um, uh, would drive you to want to learn more and to spend more time on the subject. I think it's an important one and certainly in our day. And so that being said, in um, verse 4, he begins to answer their question. And I'd like to basically, for the time that we're going to spend, talk about what, uh, what would be the signs of the last days 
as Jesus lays them forth. Again, we're going to reference some other passages, and we'll read most of this chapter. I don't know if I'll read every single passage in it, but uh, it's there for you to read as well, obviously, Matthew 24, uh, and then, of course, Luke 21 again, and Matthew 13 as well. But that being said, uh, let me go ahead and dive into some of this. Take heed, verse 4, the very first thing that Jesus points out, which I think is very, very telling. Most of us, when we think of the last days, we're thinking of judgments and earthquakes and famines and all these kinds of things. He gets to that, but I think it is significant that the very first thing he chooses to tell them as a warning and as an indicator of the last days is this, verse 4, take heed that no one deceives you. Uh, something I should mention that I, I should have mentioned a little bit earlier, but um, the last days by way of, of describing what that time frame refers to uh, is a period of time that was first uh, or, or well, earlier referenced by Joel in Joel chapter 2 and was then later referenced by Peter in Acts chapter 2. This becomes the first, uh, right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon these early believers in the upper room, uh, the apostles come out, they begin to uh, speak in tongues, actually not just the apostles, but all of those who are gathered in the upper room. Uh, tongues of fire, something like tongues of fire rests upon them and they begin to speak in tongues. They begin to speak other languages, uh, telling of the, uh, the praises of God and worshiping in that. And the people are gathered there during this period of time, a great multitude of them are gathered here during the feast season, and they are looking at this and they're stunned. What's this all about? They must be drunk or something like that. And Peter then begins to speak to them uh, and says, these are not drunk as you suppose, but rather this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, who said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. So that being said, and you can read that in Acts chapter two, and again, toward the end of Joel chapter two. Um, when you read the passage and look at what Peter just said, what he's saying is this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that which Joel spoke about in regard to the beginning, marking the beginning of what we would refer to as the last days or the end times. Um, we're, so when we're looking at Matthew 24, what we are looking at actually is a description of events that are yet future to Jesus that he is describing in regard to those events leading up to his second coming. So that being said, again, this is a very, very important passage and, uh, and those passages that connect to it help us gain understanding. But again, the very first thing that he says here in regard to the indicators or the signs of the last days is that there will be deception. I'll, I'll go on and read a little more. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Uh, now, he will then go on to talk about wars and rumors of wars and such, and then after a little bit of that, he'll once again reiterate the idea that there will be false Christs and false messiahs and this false prophets kind of a thing. Um, so claiming to come in his name in that. So deception is a very central feature, and maybe, I don't know if Jesus meant to imply this necessarily, but maybe the single most telling sign of the last days. I tend to think it is because what is more important than truth? And so one of the premier markers of the last days will be an assault upon truth and false teachers propagating such things. Clearly we see this in our day. Uh, matter of fact, let's look at a couple of passages here as we unpack this a little bit. Um, just a couple of obvious ones, uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter four uh, and 2 Timothy chapter four actually, but 1 Timothy chapter four, uh, Paul says this, Now the Spirit expressly or explicitly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, it is significant, by the way, that in verse 16 at the end of what we would call chapter 4, uh, Paul says that you should take heed, Timothy, to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who who hear you. And Timothy's already a believer at that point. He's not talking about saving Timothy and his hearers uh, in terms of salvation per se, but rather saving them from error. In other words, truth is foundational and important. And those who come in the last days as false teachers will seek to undermine these truths. As a matter of fact, they will have the help in some cases of those who hear them. Uh, chapter four of Second Timothy, I charge you therefore before God 
uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come, and here it is, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Uh, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so Timothy is warned by Paul that the day is coming when people will not want to put up with sound teaching anymore. Uh, we clearly have been in that day for a very, very long time, but it is particularly pronounced in our day. Uh, it was one thing when false teaching came from outside the church, uh, when the cults would come or something like that, or we would share an apologetic with, uh, uh, with those of other faiths and that kind of thing. Today, however, whether it's the progressive movement or the new apostolic reformation or the faith movement or any of these kinds of uh, uh, bastions of falsehood, uh, there is tremendous false teaching even from within the church. Uh, and so this is something that must be uh, recognized and addressed, responded to, stood against. Um, when, um, when questions of the gospel came up, um, uh, the idea of another gospel, uh, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul would say, let him be accursed who brings you a different gospel than the gospel that I'm sharing with you right now. And so there is nothing more important and central than the truth of the gospel message uh, in its clarity, what it is, what it is not, all these kinds of things that pertain to the truth of the gospel, which is simply this, that Christ uh, uh, was crucified, was died, and was buried all according to the scripture. Um, this is the gospel, as Paul said in Acts, or in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus, uh, or John at least recording, maybe Jesus said these words himself, or maybe it's just John's recording of them, but John 3, 16, we all know these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and just to put another uh, passage in there that is worthy of, of, uh, of memorizing, uh, second uh, Corinthians 5.21, that he, the Father, made him, the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And there are a plethora of passages that can further explain the gospel. Uh, Ephesians 2.8.9, Galatians 2.21, uh, Romans 3, verses um, 21 to 24, is just a small part of the overall scope of what the book of Romans is talking about. Again, Galatians hammers this home uh, eloquently. And so these are the truth of the gospel. At first John, you know, the idea of, of denying uh, the personhood of Christ, that uh, his physical being. Well, that's an essential part of the gospel because if he did not come in the flesh, then he could not have died for our sins. First uh, uh, Corinthians 15 in its entirety on the resurrection and such. And this, these, are, these are central passages to the truth of the gospel. And so um, false Christ, false messiahs, false prophets will come preaching a different message. And we ought not be surprised when it begins to crop up even within the church. As a matter of fact, Acts chapter 20, when Paul calls the Ephesian elders to him before he departs, he tells them that there will be those who rise up from among you. Wolves will rise up from among you, not sparing the flock. So we should recognize and we should be willing to speak out against false teaching because it is a bane upon the gospel. It is a deceptive barrier that is set up uh, before the unbeliever. And, uh, and, and so we want to make sure that we take great care in making sure to, um, to have the purity of the gospel intact in our presentations and uh, we want to make sure to defend that. But Jesus said that false teaching will come, false teachers will come, claiming to come in his name, on his behalf. Uh, and, and the ultimate example of this, and this is why I do think this central feature, uh, the central indicator of the last days being deception, uh, is likely intended to be the preeminent one. Because the final deception that takes place that ultimately brings the world uh, into complete uh, readiness for judgment uh, comes in the form of the Antichrist who will show up as we see in Revelation 13. Uh, he will ultimately, um, a mark will be taken on the right hand or forehead that will be not only the means by which you engage in, in, uh, econ in the economic system of that day, but it is also seen as an act of worship uh, to him and so to the Antichrist. And so one day there will be one who will come claiming to be uh, a Messiah of sorts, and the world will, by and large, 
uh, ultimately uh, fall in behind him. And consequently, uh, subsequently, will rebel against Christ when Christ returns behind the Antichrist. So that being said, deception. Uh, now, um, he goes on in Matthew 24. Um, and you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of of sorrows. So we now have something here that really with, uh, with the inclusion of the very first warning uh, about false teaching, we have mention of wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, famine, all these kinds of things. Uh, if you are unaware, this actually also is, uh, is, is very reminiscent of what John writes about in the book of Revelation in chapter 6. When you read about the opening of the initial seals, we see these same things ultimately coming on the scene. And so from this, we put together that Jesus is describing the same thing here that John is describing in, in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, the first seal is the rider on the white horse. Uh, there are those that believe this is Christ coming to ultimately conquer the world in that. I don't think that's the case for a number of reasons. I think that is actually picturing the Antichrist who is a false Christ, somebody who is pretending to be a Christ, going on the scene and ultimately conquering. Um, uh, this would be the Antichrist, who ultimately, in Daniel chapter uh, 9, 27, signs a covenant, uh, comes on the scene, ultimately rises to his power, his full crescendo, and, and, and uh, uh, or at least comes clearly to the fore in Revelation um, uh, 12 and 13. Uh, and then ultimately the kings of the earth in chapter 17 and such give him their power for a time and then he rises against uh, Christ at his return bringing the entire world in rebellion against him uh, in chapter 19. So anyway, so we see uh, again listed not only the deception, the false Christs and even the Antichrist but we even then begin to see as well um, famine, pestilence, earthquakes, all these kinds of things that we see unfolding as the seals are broken by the Lamb who's, uh, who took the scroll from him who sits on the throne. Uh, let me encourage you to familiarize yourself very, very much with the book of Revelation in this regard, especially when considering a passage like Matthew 24. Uh, verse uh, verse uh, 9, And then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended uh, and will betray one another and will hate one another. And then many false prophets, once again, will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. It is an important idea, I think, to interject right here, especially as we're about to move into verse 15. Who is the audience of this sermon, of this discourse? I am of the firm belief that Jesus, in speaking this sermon, is speaking about conditions that will affect anybody and everybody on the earth during that time. However, the particular audience that he's referring to and speaking to and directing these comments toward is Israel. Israel ultimately figures centrally, not just prominently, but centrally in the book of Revelation. I believe this is a time when the church will no longer be on the earth. I believe that uh, the blindness that has come upon Israel will be lifted uh, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, as Paul talks about in Romans 11.25. Uh, at that point, Israel will once again, after this age of the church, will once again become the central focus of eschatology and also God's instrument by which and through which and um, and upon which he will bring, uh, uh, bring the gospel during that period of time. So that being said, this, these words, and, and they already begin to sound uh, very much like the Old Testament would. And, and, and therefore, uh, we consider that he's referring now to God's covenant people in the Old Testament. Uh, a, a covenant people whom he will be faithful to all the way to the end, even though they continue in unbelief today, one day, as Zechariah um, 13 tells us, a third of Israel will survive the tribulation period. Um, they will ultimately enter into the millennium. Um, as Paul says again in Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. That third of Israel that remain through the tribulation will ultimately, even as Jesus seems to be implying right here, will endure to the end and will in fact be saved and will enter the millennial kingdom. 
Um, but ultimately the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world during that period of time as a witness. Uh, and then the end will come. Therefore, and now he begins to describe the great tribulation period, or what is known as the middle of the tribulation period, uh, or the last three and a half year, 1260 day period of the tribulation period. Uh, this can also be known as uh, the second half of Daniel's 70th week, uh, referring to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Uh, verse 27 also indicates the midway point of this 70th week, when at the beginning of the week, the uh, um, uh, this this man uh, this one will rise up and and uh, confirm uh, and or sign a covenant with the many, but ultimately that midway through the seven year period that that covenant will last, he will violate it by causing the offerings and sacrifices to cease. That is a telling statement because it lets us know that there will be offerings and sacrifices, which therefore means there must be a temple. Now, verse 24 of that prophecy tells us that Israel is the focus of this prophecy. So therefore, when we talk about uh, the ending of offerings and sacrifices and all this kind of thing, we understand that during that period of time being referred to, which is a period of time that has not begun yet, the 70th week is still yet future to our time, we can know that there will be a covenant that is confirmed, there will be a temple, uh, whether as a result of that covenant or not is not completely clear, although I tend to think it probably will have something to do with it, but we don't know that for sure. We do know that in the middle of that 70th week, that seven year period of time, that final seven year period of time leading up to the return of Christ, in the middle of that, there will be a, uh, an end to sacrifices and offerings brought. And therefore, uh, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Okay, so in other words, this abomination of desolation that Daniel the prophet spoke about. Um, he spoke about it in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 12. So when you look up these passages, you will see this mention of this abomination of desolation or this abomination that makes desolate. It's used uh, variously. What is Jesus referring to? He's talking about something that will be in the holy place that desecrates the holy place. Um, I believe, and, and, and many uh, Bible students believe, that this is what John is referring to when he talks about the, uh, the, the image that the false prophet, the partner of the Antichrist, causes the world to come together and to build. And this image, therefore, then causes the world, both small and great, to take a mark uh, of allegiance, of worship, of entrance into the economic system, that really the economic, political, and religious system of that time uh, as, as, a, as a matter of worship to the beast in that. I think that this is the same thing that Jesus is referring to, that Daniel was referring to, and also that Paul is referring to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You'll want to become very familiar with that as well. When this man of sin goes into the temple of God, declares himself to be God, showing himself that he is God, and he demands to be worshipped above all that is called God. So, one question that arises naturally out of this is that how do we know this hasn't already happened? Uh, some people like to point to Antiochus Epiphanes in 165 BC as being a uh, fulfillment of this, of Daniel's prophecy, uh, because he goes into the temple, he slaughters a pig on the altar and in a worship to a false god, and therefore this looks like the abomination of desolation. Uh, and if Jesus had not said, verse 15 of Matthew 24, we might be prone to think that maybe that was it. However, Jesus talks about when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet, and then he goes on to describe what they should do in response. Flee, run, run for your lives. Don't go back into your houses and grab anything. Pray that it's not during uh, winter and all that. Pray for the, the, the pregnant women in that where it's going to be harder upon and all that. Pray it's not on the Sabbath. Again, another indicator he's talking to Jews here. Um, so in Jesus' words, he's implying that this event has not taken place yet. So that rules out um, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. What about 70 AD? You already mentioned that Titus destroys the temple in 70 AD. How do we know that's not it? A lot of people like to point to that, uh, particularly preterists like to point to that. Those who believe that the, uh, um, that the uh, prophetic elements of scripture in regard to last things were fulfilled completely by 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Well, I think the fact that the temple was destroyed without there being an abomination of desolation spoken of, in, uh, uh, spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place means that that didn't fit the bill. Uh, there were no offerings and sacrifices that were caused to cease as a result of a covenant that was signed or anything like that. 
uh, or as, as part of a covenant that was signed. There was no covenant that seemed to give them the freedom now to do this and then it was stopped in the middle or some kind of a thing. Uh, it just, on a number of levels, it just doesn't fit. So that's why I say, and I feel pretty confident about this, that this is an event that is yet future, has not happened yet. Which, by the way, quick interjection, this is why we pay attention to uh, uh, the plans to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem, the idea of these red heifers, which are used in the purification rites for the rededication of the temple. Um, when we talk about the Levitical line being uh, being uh, reestablished and, and, uh, and, dis- and rediscovered in that so they can have the Levitical priesthood back in place and all these kinds of things. Um, we are not, on the one hand, we're very excited at the prospect of these things because it is an indicator of God fulfilling his purposes and moving closer and closer to the finalizing of his purposes. But on the other hand, as we've mentioned before, we want to be careful not to celebrate it uh, on, on the other hand because it is a temple that will be built in disbelief. Uh, the temple uh, of, in, in, the, in the past and the tabernacle and such were really uh, built in anticipation. The offerings and sacrifices and such were in anticipation of the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. The temple that will be built in the future here during the time of the tribulation or, or that will be standing during the time of the tribulation uh, is one that is is an affront really to the gospel because it is built in rejection of Christ's finished sacrifice in that. So that being said, we like to pay attention to what's happening because it gives us a sense of where we might be and how quickly or slowly, as the case might be, we're moving toward that. And there are other indicators as well. There's Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's Ezekiel 28, there's uh, Psalm 83, there's all these other places where events are described and there's debate as to whether these things uh, have happened or not. I don't think Ezekiel 38 and 39 has happened yet, but some of the other events, there is still some ongoing debate about whether or not those things have taken place. Uh, I'm still kind of on the fence a little bit myself in that regard, but but that being said, they're out there uh, to be studied and considered. So that being said, uh, back in Matthew 24, again, uh, uh, the idea of flee uh, in Judea, uh, flee to the mountains, let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Why? Because Sabbath law requires people not to work or to do things on the Sabbath. And so this would be something that would cause some confusion as to how the Jews should respond when that event happens. Jesus says, run. Now, some will look at this and say, well, this is Jesus answering the first question. When will these things happen, i.e. the destruction of the temple? I've already kind of spoken to that. Um, But I think that what Jesus, it seems clear to me that what Jesus is describing here is not the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, but really what is described by John in Revelation chapter 12, when ultimately Israel is chased off into the wilderness um, after the birth of Christ, after he is caught up into heaven in the resurrection, uh, the Antichrist, uh, as inspired by the dragon, Satan, ultimately goes after Israel, chases, chases them off into the wilderness. Uh, they will ultimately end up in, in the area that we know as Petra. It's, uh, it's a place, uh, sort of a city cut in the hills. This is where they're going to hide. And it's where they will be when Christ returns to rescue them from, uh, from Antichrist's forces that uh, ultimately are coming against them, but will then turn their attention upon Jesus when he does come to rescue them. So I think that what Jesus is describing here in verses 15 on now begin to speak to the time of tribulation. Uh, and in particular, the midway point of the tribulation. Chapter 12, they're chasing the wilderness. Chapter uh, 13, there is this abomination of desolation. All these events are now taking place in the middle of the tribulation period. Um, again, he mentions false Christs and stuff. He says, when, when anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The elect in that time are mostly speaking of Jews. Uh, It would be, in my view, particularly speaking of Jews who are God's elect in the Old Covenant, and here they now, during the tribulation period, are now considered as his elect as well. uh, You might notice, by the way, in Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, Romans, um, when, uh, again, in Romans 11, um, Paul talks about how for the sake of the fathers, uh, the elect, uh, their election and such is is irrevocable. The giftings and calling are irrevocable in that. Uh, so that being said, um, we're talking about that group of people, I believe, in this time here. And that's what Jesus has in view, I think. So uh, 
he says, see, I told you beforehand. So when someone claims to be Christ and he's coming with a message or the Christ consciousness or the Christ spirit or something, do not believe it. And here is dramatically why. Verse 27. Uh, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles be gathered together. So in other words, when he comes, like lightning from the east to the west, every eye will see him. He will come in power and great glory. There will be no mistaking his second coming. Uh, So do not be duped or fooled. And he says, see, I'm telling you this in advance so you're not fooled by those who would claim to be Christ or a Christ figure. Now, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, uh, he begins now to speak to the judgments that are described in uh, Revelation 8 and 9 and also 15 and 16 and such. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. By the way, Son of Man is a messianic term. Uh, Ezekiel also applies it to himself, but by and large, the term Son of Man applies to the Messiah. And be coming on the clouds of heaven with great power again and great glory. And he will send his angels with great sound of a, great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Uh, Why would he do that? Why? Because he's about to establish the millennial kingdom when he comes and puts down those who are in rebellion against him. Those who, upon whom God has now finally sent a great delusion. Why? Because they did not love the truth. So that being said, he now tells them uh, in sort of a summary statement here, now from verse 32 on, uh, well, I shouldn't say a summary, it's pretty long for a summary, but he now begins to sort of uh, wrap it up here. Verse 32, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. I should interject here that in Luke it says, and all the trees, okay? We wanna be a little careful how we understand this passage. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When the branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, know that uh, that it is near, even at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, there is uh, much debate about um, who's in view here. Is It's the fig tree, so it must be Israel. Not necessarily. Again, Luke says, notice, Jesus says, notice, uh, pay attention to the tree and all, the fig tree and all the trees, right? So he's not just singly saying the fig tree. Plus, the fig tree is also Uh, and uh, speaks of other things besides Israel in the Old Testament. So I don't think we have to necessarily say that when we begin to see Israel come back in the land and all those kinds of things, that is therefore then the generation. I hope it is. There might be somebody who's 100 plus years old who still exists from that time, and, and, and that's what God meant. And so it could be any minute. But I'm saying I don't know that the passage requires us to understand it in those terms. Could be, again, I'm not ruling out completely. There might be somebody out there that still is alive from the time that Israel became a nation. But uh, I don't really think it has to be seen necessarily that way. But the generation that does see all these things come to pass, uh, that is the one that ultimately, uh, that generation will be the one that sees all of it finished. Again, this is a point at which preterists and, uh, uh, and, and, and those who don't hold the preterist view would differ. Uh, one of those areas that we would see this differently. Uh, in the preterist mindset, well, this must therefore have happened and be completed by 70 AD because those people there today, what else could it have been? But again, I think that if that, if that, uh, if everything else fit the bill, then sure, but very little fits the bill. And so I don't think we can look at that and say that that's that generation. Uh, some of the things, the reasons I've already given, but that being said, now he goes on in another passage that there are varying views on. But of that day and hour, nobody knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And some manuscripts also say, nor even the Son, Um, uh, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man, or will the Son of Man be. For in the days before the, uh, the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until that day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came Uh, and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. 
But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So that being said, um, this passage sounds rapture right? No one knows the day or the hour and that kind of thing. I don't think that that's at all what Jesus is referring to personally. With respect to other very good Bible teachers, I don't say other like I'm a good one, but just uh, there are a lot of really great Bible teachers out there who, uh, who say, well, sure, that's the rapture. I personally don't think so. I think that this would speak to the time of the second coming. Nobody knows. Um, again, some manuscripts include Jesus in that, uh, the, son of, the Son of Man. Um, others manuscripts don't so what what did jesus say and what did matthew record well it could be different things but the idea here is that nobody knows i personally like to think that during that time even jesus didn't know we know in luke's gospel that he grew in wisdom and stature in his humanity he never ceased to be god but he did take on humanity and he took on some of the various limitations that came with that including some of the knowledge that he gained during the course of his earthly life um So is it possible that during his earthly ministry, he did not know when the rapture would come? I think it's possible. I also think it plays well into uh, what Jesus says in John's gospel, chapter 14, when he sort of draws from this idea of the wedding idea, that, uh, that the bridegroom goes and begins to build the house and he's going to prepare a place for his bride. And when the father says it's time to go get his bride, then he comes and receives her to himself. And Jesus uses that imagery in what he has to say in John 14. And so, um, it, now granted, in, 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 the, in the apostles, uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he never really spoke about the rapture. This was something that Paul says was a mystery until later on when uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he begins to elaborate on this idea some. And of course, in 1, Cor- uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, he talks about the idea of, of the of believers uh, in Christ being caught up uh, to meet the Lord in the air. But during his earthly ministry, Jesus did not really speak to the rapture. So it seems like an interjection of something here that is just as easily explained as the second coming. Um, I would argue that Daniel's prophecy in Daniel um, you know, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, I think do give us the timeline for Jesus' first coming and also Jesus' second coming. However, the timing for the first and second comings are both contingent on a starting point. When the Antichrist comes on the scene and confirms the covenant, we know at that point that there will be seven years. So at that point, they will know. Anyone who's paying attention or knows the, the, the word at that time will know. But when Jesus said this, nobody knew. And again, I think that kind of fits into some of the imagery that he uses. So, uh, but again, there are those, there are, there are some very good Bible teachers that disagree and they think, well, this is clearly talking about the rapture. We would just agree to disagree on that and we'll find out one day. But that being said, <clears throat> when it talks about as in the days of Noah, some people wrestle with that because it sounds like everybody's just having a great time. So that must be speaking about the rapture because how could everybody be just living and, and partying and getting married and all that kind of stuff like everything's going on? Like nothing's got like like there's nothing really going on to alert them. Um, again, I think there's an alternative possibility to understanding that the days of Noah during the days of Noah, marriage, and all this partying and stuff took on a very very different uh, aura, or a different understanding. The days leading up to the flood were marked by what took place in Genesis chapter six when the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took many of them as wives, as many as they wanted. So marriage in that sense now becomes a very different thing than our sort of marriage festival and celebrations and white dresses and all that kind of stuff. This actually became, was very, very different in the time of Noah. While that might indicate that there might be something akin to that that's taking place as an indicator of the last days as well. Um, we talked a little about a bit about that in the past and, and that, but I'll just kind of leave that there for now. Um, and then the two men uh, and the two women, uh, one taken, one left. I happen to think that is better understood as being one that is ultimately taken in judgment during that period of time, during the tribulation, which is the period of time Jesus is referring to during all this. And one is left who then enters the millennium, those who ultimately uh, um, uh, as, as Jesus said just a little bit earlier there, I just use his exact words, 
uh, those who endure to the end shall be saved, right? Well, that I think would be speaking of those. So that being said, um, he then finishes in verse 45 through 51 and says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household or steward who became a steward over the household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. In other words, that servant who is uh, who recognizes what's going on around him and is busy about the Lord's business. So during that tribulation period, one should be actively about the Lord's business, knowing that his coming is very, very soon. However, by contrast, assuredly I or I should say to finish that thought, assuredly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods, Uh, likely then therefore speaking of his place in the millennium. In verse 48, by contrast, but if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him uh, and an hour uh, that he uh, uh, is not aware of and will cut him into two and appoint him a portion with the hypocrites. Uh, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, those who reject the idea of his coming and all of that ultimately will face Uh, the wrath of God on them and that kind of thing. So, uh, and by the way, uh, Peter alludes to this same kind of a mindset in uh, in, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, where he talks about those who say, well, where's the sign of his coming? Because things have been just like they always have been. What's like, what, 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 you know, what, like, where's this coming? They're mocking. And Peter says, well, look, don't, don't be fooled by that. Don't buy into that because for the Lord, time's irrelevant. A year, a, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. In other words, it's not a matter of like, oh, from our perspective, a lot of time has gone by. From God's perspective, he's doing things right on his timetable. And so therefore, um, you know, we should not in any way sort of let our guard down or be slack about any of this. I think we should recognize that Jesus' second coming will come in his time. But now to interject a rapture thought, which again, I don't think is seen here in the passage necessarily, But when you look at the rapture as described in, again, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 50 to 58, or 56 really, but, uh, or uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 um, and and such, I think that there appears to have been, not only on Paul's part, but also on the early church's part, therefore, based on his teaching of the early church to the church, it would appear that they lived in the constant readiness of seeing Jesus. As a matter of fact, it would appear in 1 Thessalonians that Paul is writing this letter because they're concerned that Jesus hasn't come back to get them and some of them have already died and they believe that they had now entered the day of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and Paul says, look, that day is not going to come, you know, until the falling away, until the, uh, the uh, son of perdition on the scene. And also, uh, before the restrainer is taken out of the way. And then after he's taken out of the way, then the um, the man of sin will be revealed, right? So uh, again, uh, first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two. So we want to be uh, very, very conscious of the reality of the coming of Christ and his soon coming. If, if indicators in the world around us are beginning to look like Jesus described, like John, uh, I shouldn't say John because those things will take place uh, uh, primarily during then the tribulation period in that from chapter 6 on, but that Jesus described or that are spoken of in the Old Testament as relate to Israel and things like this, we should be thinking, okay, well, we are clearly moving toward that period of time. And as things ramp up, we might move in there at a breakneck pace. So don't, don't just sort of... Uh, feel like, well, he hasn't come yet, so this obviously none of this stuff is really true. We just need a whatever. No, it's actually the evil servant that says that. Jesus doesn't commend anybody for sort of talking about his coming being way down the road somewhere. Um, so we don't want to really approach it that way. But rather instead, let me, I mentioned Second Peter chapter 3. Let me invite you to turn there. Um, here, uh, um, at the end of uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, really the end of the epistle, therefore, he says these words, and I think it's it's good for us. Um, actually, you know what I think I might do? I might, uh, I might have done this once before, but I might just go ahead and do it again now. 
Uh, and that is just read chapter 3 as sort of our closing thought as we wrap this up. Beloved, I now write this to you, the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure mind by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers uh, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens of old uh, were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which uh, are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In other words, there it is. There's the response to those who are looking for the Lord's coming. Since these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be, therefore, in holiness, in, con- in conduct, um, in holy conduct, and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, is written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking uh, in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being uh, steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Could there be a richer admonition? So, Father, we thank you and praise you uh, for that which is going to be worked out, that which your purposes and plans uh, will ultimately find uh, fully realized. Uh, We thank you that uh, one day all of us as, uh, as born again followers of Christ Jesus will experience the fullness of redemption. And in the time between now and then, help us to be about your business. If we truly are looking forward to the coming of Christ, then we ought to, therefore, respond accordingly. So help us to be about uh, the gospel. Help us to be about uh, sharing the good news that others, too, might enter in uh, to the kingdom of God as your children, sons and daughters. We thank you for your great love, uh, that great love that compelled you to send your only begotten son, that Whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he was crucified and was buried and rose again the third day, even according to your word. And so, Father, we thank you that you are the great giver of the promises and the fulfiller of the promises. And so we thank you for all that is yet to come. And we pray for grace and strength and courage and a sense of purpose and calling in the days that now are. So we thank you. We love you. We bless you. We are thrilled at the prospect of seeing you. So. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Truly, Maranatha, please come. We love you and thank you. And ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.